Let's now have a look at our first category of controllers, black box controllers. Black box controllers, as already mentioned, are called black box controllers because they don't assume knowledge about the process. And thus they are versatile and can be applied to any process, potentially. The most simple form of a black box controller is called a bang bang controller. A bang bang controller is also called a hysteresis controller. It's often applied, for example, in household thermostats. And it's called a bang bang controller because it switches abruptly between two states. The mathematical formulation for this controller is simple. Remember again that we're defining this orange box from the diagram before, which as an input has the arrow and as an output the correcting variable u. So we need to define a mapping from e to u if we want to define a controller. So how does a bang bang controller work now? Well, it's rather simple. So the most simple form of this is simply this case um, distinction here, where u is defined as u1, which is a parameter of this controller, if the error is above a threshold, and it's defined as u2, another parameter of this controller, otherwise. So this controller, in its most simple form, has three parameters, u1, u2, and tau. And if you think, for example, of a thermostat, it will turn the heating on if the temperature falls below a certain value. If ET falls below a certain threshold, it will go into, uh, will add the correct, or will output the correcting variable u1, which might be turn the heating on, and otherwise, it might um, output the variable u2, which um, means turn the heating off. So this was the most simple controller, but as you can imagine, it wouldn't work very well for cars, for controlling cars. It would lead to a very zigzaggy behavior if you would implement that. It wouldn't be very comfortable. And we are going to see an example of this also in a later video. So we need something better. And this something better is called a PID controller, which is also a black box controller. PID controllers are the most common controllers in industrial applications. In probably 95% of all cases where you need a controller, a PID controller is used because of its simplicity and um, because of its broad application range. So what is a PID controller? Again, we have to define the orange box. The rest of the diagram is as before, comprises the process and the sensor. The PID controller also doesn't require knowledge about the plant or process to be controlled. And it comprises, in contrast to the bang bang controller, it comprises three elements. It comprises a proportional element that outputs a value, a correcting value that's proportional to the error. So there's no thresholding happening here anymore, but it's the error itself that's output times a parameter of the PID controller, the proportional gain KP. So in contrast to the bang bang controller, if you have a P controller, if you just have the P element, you're applying a proportional control, which means that the correcting variable is proportional to the error. It's not a binary decision between two variables, between two parameters of a bang bang controller, but it's proportional to the error. So it can lead to a smoother control behavior. And there's two other elements in a PAD controller. One is the integral element that integrates the error over all previous time steps and multiplies that with a integral gain Ki. 
And then finally, there is a differential that computes the derivative of the error with respect to time. So this is the time derivative and similarly multiplies that with a, um, a differential gain KD. So there's another parameter of this PID controller. The PID controller has three parameters, KP, KI and KD. And it computes the error, the integral of the error over all previous time steps and the derivative of the error at the current time step. And it multiplies those quantities with the respective parameters. And then it sums it all up. And this is the output u. This is the correcting variable that's handed over to the process. Again, similar to before, we have the reference variable r that we want to attain, the correcting variable u that's output um, by the controller, the controlled variable y that we want to make similar to r, and then we have the sensor um, and the error that's the difference between r and y. The mathematical formulation of the PID controller is given in this simple formula here. As already discussed, the uh, correction variable is simply the sum of these three elements, the proportional element, the integral element, and the differential element with the corresponding parameters. Why do we need three elements? Well, all of these three elements have a different purpose. The most important element, obviously, is the proportional element. The proportional element makes sure that we are actually controlling the process, that the error is minimized, proportional with the gain kp. However, using the proportional element alone does often not work very well in practice, and we'll see an example very soon. Using the proportional element alone leads to overshooting and oscillation typically. Because as we are reducing the error, as soon as we um, pass the zero error level, we're going into the other direction. The uh, controller has no idea that we have already approached zero. So it continues and increases the error with a negative sign or increases the basically with a negative sign. So the error is unsigned, right? It's it's this, uh, this here minus this. So we are changing the sign simply. Therefore, a D element, a differential element is important. And that's what's called a PD control, a proportional differential control, if you just have these two elements. Adding a D element to the proportional control alleviates this problem by introducing a damping behavior and therefore avoiding overshooting or oscillation. And then finally, the full PAD controller comprises also this integral element, which corrects, which is able to correct residual errors by integrating past error measurements. So here's an example of a proportional controller and then a proportional differential controller. First, let's look at a proportional controller. What do we have here? Let's first understand the system that I used in order to create these plots. The control variable is simply the position. So y of t we call uh, equal to x of t, which is the, the position of a system. Say you're in a car and you want to move that car forward and we are measuring longitudinal position of that car along a path, along the road, for example. Now, in order to move that car, we can't directly modify the position, but we can only apply um, forces to the tires, which means we can only apply acceleration effectively to the vehicle in order to manipulate the position of the car. So the correcting variable, the input to the process, the vehicle in this case, is the acceleration. 
and we say u of t, which is the correcting variable. Let's remember this diagram again. u of t is the input to the process, y of t is the output, y of t is the position, and u of t is the acceleration. Where the acceleration is, of course, the second time derivative of the position. So this is our system. It's a very simple system. It's basically just a double integrator that takes the value u, um, integrates it twice, and outputs y. And this is what I have implemented here. Now, let's assume this car that we want to move forward. We want to move forward by one meter. And the car is currently at position zero. And this is shown here by the reference uh, value plotted over time in blue. For the first 20 time steps, the vehicle is supposed to be at zero, and it is at zero, so the arrow is zero. But then, at time step 20, we ask the vehicle to move to uh, position one, to move one meter forward. And so we have the step function here in blue. This is the reference value over time. Now, of course, this car can't immediately jump to one meter, so it needs to apply acceleration in order to move forward. And what has happened here is we have implemented a proportional control. So the proportional gain is 0.05 in this case. It's a small proportional gain. And the differential gain is zero, which means the differential part is turned off. And there's also no integral element here. Now, what happens in this case? Well, the result of the simulation is the red dotted curve. Ideally, the red dotted curve would be identical to the blue curve, but it is not. What happens instead is that, well, first, correctly, the vehicle starts accelerating, but the controller, because it's just a proportional controller, doesn't realize at this point yet that we have actually reduced the error to zero because it's missing the differential element that indicates this. And so it continues and overshoots and only here it realizes, oh, we went too far and it starts decelerating. But because of the mass and inertia of the system, deceleration is as slow as acceleration. And so we need all the way until the vehicle has moved forward by two meters in order to come to a full stop. Now what happens here is that we accelerate in the opposite direction, but we are overshooting again until we come to a full stop now, um, in this case, again at position zero, where we have actually started. And you can see where this is going. We are oscillating heavily in this case. We are always overshooting um, the actual target value, the reference value that we want to achieve. So this is obviously not a very good controller apart from that it wouldn't lead to very comfortable driving. On the right, you can see what happens if we take the same controller. It's still a proportional controller, but we increase the proportional gain parameter from 0 0.05 to 0 0.5. And what happens in this case is that the oscillation becomes faster, becomes quicker but we still have the oscillating behavior and we never actually reach a steady state where we reach this reference value and maintain it. So hopefully this illustrates the problem with just using a proportional controller. Now what happens if we add a differential element? Now we have a PD controller. In this case, the um, behavior of this oscillating function is dampened. So we, we, we don't overshoot as much to start with because we already know here that we are closer to the target value. So we don't overshoot as much. And so with every swing, we are overshooting less until we have reached the target value in close proximity. In this case, we've used a differential element with a differential gain factor of 0 0.1. If we now increase that differential gain factor from 0 0.1 
to 0 0.5, the dampening effect becomes even stronger. And we can see that we can, in this particular case, for this very simple system, of course, um, even avoid overshooting entirely and reach the reference value quickly without overshooting and maintaining that value until that reference value is changed again. So I hope this could illustrate the importance of adding a differential element at least to the proportional controller if you have such a system that is such a dub double integrator, which is not something unreasonable because if you want to do ACC, adaptive cruise control, or just cruise control, you have to implement such a system. Now the question of course is how can we select, select these parameters in an optimal way? How can we select these gain factors in an optimal way? As PID controllers are often used to control black box processes, we need heuristics and there have been various heuristics proposed to set the parameters of a PID controller and the most common one is called Ziegler-Nichols based on the inventors of this heuristic. The algorithm, the heuristic is very simple. <clears throat> we first set the integral and the differential gain factors to zero such that we observe first of all just a the system in a closed loop so we have to take observations of the system in order to execute this algorithm but we observe first what happens with just a proportional controller so using this proportional controller we are increasing the proportional gain starting from zero until the so-called ultimate gain kp equals ku is attained where the system oscillates. So the definition of the ultimate gain is that the system must oscillate. And so we increase the proportional gain until we see oscillating behavior. And then we measure the oscillation period at that ultimate gain factor KU for the proportional controller. And once we have measured the oscillation period, we are simply setting the proportional, the integral and the differential factors as given through this formula that has been heuristically derived through computer simulations. So these heuristics have been derived empirically using computer simulations. And while they provide a good starting point, in practice often manual fine tuning of these is required. It's often the case that these are not the ideal settings for your controller and you still need to slightly adapt them for your particular problem in order for your controller to exhibit optimal behavior. But at least it's a starting point. Okay, so let's look at some con more concrete examples of how a PAD controller could be used in the context of controlling a vehicle. Let's first have a look at longitudinal vehicle control, which means um, controlling the speed of the vehicle. Here, v of t is the target velocity at time t that we want to control. So this is the variable y. <clears throat> One, um, or in, no, in, in this case, actually, this is the target velocity. So this is variable r. This is the reference. <clears throat> so the question is how to set this, val uh, this, this reference value. And um, this formula I've seen before, actually already, I think in lecture two, it's a formula that basically says, well, I'm, I'm setting this to the maximal velocity. That is a parameter of my formula. And I multiply this with one minus exponential of this expression here, which lowers the speed. Um, so this is between zero and one. So it lowers the speed depending on how close we are to the preceding vehicle. Um, if we come closer to the preceding vehicle, if this distance to the preceding car is uh, zero, let's say, then this expression here will become close to one and the, the target velocity will reduce to zero. 
So this is how you could imagine an AC, a simple ACC, Adaptive Cruise Control System, would be implemented. Now in the context of this control closed loop diagram here on the right, what would the different variables correspond to? And note that also here we have, for simplicity, um, just removed the sensor block and assumed that directly the output of the process, the vehicle, um, velocity is measured. <clears throat> so what is what are the different um, quantities in this concrete example? Well, the reference variable we already talked about, r of t, equals to the target velocity. The correcting variable is the gas and the brake pedal setting, which effectively influences the acceleration of the vehicle. And the controlled variable, uh, y of t, is the current velocity. And now the error is, of course, the difference between the reference variable, the target velocity v, and the current velocity y. And note that this error doesn't contain any square or any norm. It is a signed error because, of course, the controller has to know the sign. It has to know in which direction to control. Another example is lateral vehicle control. One way of formulating lateral vehicle control is to specify a so-called cross-check error. In this case, the cross-check error is defined by the distance between the center of gravity of the vehicle and the closest point on the path that the vehicle shall follow. And what we want to set now is not the vehicle speed, <clears throat> but the steering angle of the vehicle, which we called delta before. And in this concrete case, it's of course the input to our system, u of t, the correcting variable, is the steering angle. So let's look at all the variables again for this lateral vehicle control example. The reference variable r of t in this case is zero because what we want is that this, the output here, which in this case is defined as um, the cross-check error, the controlled variable is the cross-check error. We want this cross-check error to become zero. So the reference is zero. The correcting variable u is the steering angle delta. The controlled variable y is the cross-check error, which we want to minimize. And the error is zero minus y of t, which is the negative cross-check error. Um, to get a better understanding of the behavior of a PID controller, I want to show you this little video here. The technology being developed for driverless vehicles is pretty incredible. In the near future, there will be robotic cars traveling on normal roads with the safety and efficiency of the best human drivers. These autonomous vehicles use various sensors to be able to localize themselves in any environment. They are also then able to construct a detailed plan to get from their current location to any desired destination. This video will provide an introduction to how these autonomous vehicles are then able to follow their desired trajectories. Getting a vehicle to follow a trajectory may seem simple to those who have driven before. But is it? Let's take a deeper look at this in a lab setting. If we want to follow a line, but we are too far to the left, we turn to the right, and vice versa. But how much do we turn? If the steering wheel is turned a fixed amount to the left or to the right, the approach is called bang-bang control. For controlling a car, this doesn't actually work that well. The response is very jerky and uncomfortable for the passengers. Fortunately, we don't have to steer like this in a car, since there is a range of angles the steering wheel can take. One way to set the steering wheel angle is to use what is called proportional control. Rather than turn the wheel a fixed amount, proportional control steers harder the further away we are from the desired trajectory. We take a measurement called the cross-track error to define how far away from the desired trajectory the vehicle is. Therefore, the steering angle we use is this cross-track error multiplied by a scaling factor called the proportional gain. The range of values the proportional gain can take drastically alters the performance of the vehicle. As you can see from this overlay, the performance gets better as the gain increases, but at a cost. If you start too far away from the desired trajectory with a high gain, the system can spin out of control. With the best gains, proportional control returns better results than bang-bang control, but it still doesn't work that well. With proportional control, the car can be crooked when it reaches the center line. The result of this is that the controller will repeatedly overshoot the actual desired trajectory and not actually follow it. 
To correct this overshooting problem, we need to consider additional error measurements and use them to update our steering command. A good candidate for an extra measurement is to look at the cross-track error rate, or in other words, how fast we are moving in a perpendicular direction with respect to the desired trajectory. If we are perfectly following the trajectory, our cross-track error rate will be zero. In control theory, this is what is called a derivative term. This rate term can then be multiplied by its own gain and added to the proportional term to construct an updated controller. Now that we have two terms, we have two gains that must be tuned simultaneously. Conceptually, we can think that increasing the proportional gain will increase the pull that the vehicle feels towards the desired trajectory. Increasing the derivative gain increases the resistance the car will feel against moving too quickly towards the line. Fixing the proportional gain, if the derivative gain is too low, the system will be what is called under damped and it will still oscillate. If the derivative gain is too high, the system will be what is called overdamped and will take a long time to correct for offsets. Properly choosing the derivative gain allows the car to approach the desired trajectory quickly with a cross-track error rate close to zero. This is called being critically damped. Despite the success so far, for a complete controller, we're not done yet. Environmental factors or mechanical defects can change the vehicle's nominal behavior and thus the performance of the controller. For example, if there is a heavy crosswind, the vehicle will drift unless the driver counteracts this wind force with a corrective steering command. Here is an example we can easily demonstrate. Imagine our vehicle is driving along and hits a pile of rocks which knocks its front end out of alignment, and therefore a zero steering command no longer keeps the vehicle driving straight. As you can see with the controller that has been described so far, the vehicle experiences a buildup of a lane offset, or a steady state error. One way to address this problem is to add yet another term called an integral term. This third measurement sums up the cross-track error to give an indication if we are spending more time on one side of the trajectory or the other. You can see that if we sum up the cross-track errors, we obviously spend more time on one side of the trajectory. The integral term we propose is then exactly this sum multiplied by a gain. Now, three gains will need to be tuned all at once, which can be quite difficult to do by hand. If the gain is too large, the controller can go unstable because normal controller fluctuations will be exaggerated. If the gain is too small, it can take too long to respond to these dynamic changes. When the gain is just right, the controller will be able to quickly correct for the front end misalignment and return to its nominal performance. The combination of these three terms is then what is referred to in control theory as PID control. There are other more advanced controllers that can be used for self-driving cars, but they will all look similar to the one we have described in this video. There will always be some measurements made about the state of the vehicle which are then compared to some desired vehicle trajectory to construct a steering angle that ultimately controls the car. Hopefully this gives some insight into the control strategies that can help make self-driving cars possible. Okay. To conclude this unit, I want to show you one more example of a PID controller um, that is used in practice and we our research group is using that one as well on some of our agents driving in the Kala simulator. This is um, a paper not from our group, but uh, a paper called Learning by Cheating from Coil 2019, where we have implemented such a PID controller that's controlling based on waypoints that are output by a driving policy. So it's a waypoint based vehicle control. Imagine the input, the image, is fed to a neural network and the neural network outputs waypoints as we have discussed in the imitation learning lecture. And let's call these waypoints in bird's eye view. Um, so these are two dimensional, let's call them W1 to WK. The example with four waypoints is illustrated here. This is the output of the perception stack. We can, based on these waypoints, define two controllers. The first is on velocity, the longitudinal PID controller. What we can do is um, we can measure the integral um, or the, the expected velocity when following these waypoints. Um, and uh, based on that uh, expected velocity, um, uh, or, um, set the velocity or um, the reference velocity based on that expected velocity, which means that if your perception stack predicts the waypoints closer to you, the vehicle should go slower compared to if it predicts the, we uh, the waypoints far away, which means that uh, one or two or three seconds into the future, which is the definition of the next waypoint, you have to be further away. So you have to go at a higher speed. So what we're doing here is effectively taking the distance between adjacent waypoints, um, the L2 distance, and divide by 
the uh, uh, time step in between and then take the average in order to arrive at the target velocity that we set as the reference for the longitudinal PAD controller. Um, a, similarly, a steering controller, a lateral PAD controller can be implemented. In this case, an arc, a circular arc is fit to these four waypoints and a point at a certain look ahead distance is selected on that arc as the point where we want to steer towards. And then the steering angle can be set by measuring the angle between the vehicle heading and the direction towards that um, look ahead point P on that arc. An example of such a waypoint based control is given here in this work neural attention fields where also waypoints are predicted. Um, in this visualization, not all of the waypoints are visualized only the trajectory in red to the uh, through all of the four waypoints is visualized as well as the furthest waypoint. But you can see that the waypoints are predicted closer to the vehicle indicated here by this triangle. This is the camera. Um, if the vehicle shall stop and if the vehicle shall drive, then the waypoints are predicted further into the future because the semantic meaning of these waypoints is um, where the vehicle should be uh, at a specific time into the future. For example, one second into the future for the first waypoint, two seconds into the future for the second waypoint, uh, three seconds into the future for the third waypoint, and so forth.